Hmm. Okay, let's start with the fashion statement. <laughs> it's not that Barbara's not here. <laughs> it's actually that uh, someone who comes here to the center came by during the week and uh, saw me and I was dressed down like I am during the week. And she looked at me and said, I've never seen you outside of a suit. And in my highly evolved uh, mental state, I immediately thought, well, that's just wrong. <laughs> so I thought, I'd, uh, when I went to the closet this morning, I looked, I said, uh, you're going to act like it's spring, and maybe that'll influence uh, the environment. And the sun's out, and the wind seems to have died down, so maybe it's working. <laughs> People have already made comments this morning about how they can hear me better if I'm dressed like this, so who knows, maybe that closet of, of expensive suits is going to have to all go to Denver. Anyway. Mm. So something interesting is happening in my life. Um, I'm coming to the point in June where I will have uh, been in the science of mind philosophy for 30 years. Yeah. And what's important about that was when I found the science of mind philosophy, I was 30. So I will, I'll be reaching that point where I've actually been in the philosophy longer than I was out of it. I like that idea. I remember when I got to the point in my life where Barbara had been married to me longer than any of her other husbands. I liked it. There's something about using time to your advantage. You know? So uh, it's been an interesting road being uh, in the science of mind. I grew up Southern Baptist, and I, uh, I honor the, the Southern Baptist tradition, and, and it is a path to God just like everything else. It's a little more meandering than I prefer, uh, but for, for my liking. But, but uh, you know, that, I, I learned a lot there. One thing that happened, though, that, that kind of was interesting, and I, and I embraced it for a long time, was this idea that, that what I was taught as a child was, don't look at other Christians to learn how to be a Christian. Look to Jesus. And that seemed logical, but at some point in time it occurred to me that I was, uh, I, I was looking at a, uh, let me see, I actually worded it very nicely here, I want to read this, an idealized image of a mythological God-man uh, to see how I'm doing in my life. At that point, I rejected that notion that who I think Jesus is is not my model for how I want to be. The only model for how I want to be is me. But what I need to do that well are some tools. I need to know how to be the best me that I can be. And so that's the journey. And I believe that's why we gather here on Sunday. To get inspired, to hear beautiful music, to be together in friendship, to create social uh, opportunities. Yes, all of that. However, we want to leave here a little bit clearer about who we are and how to live our lives in a meaningful way than we did before we got here. And we keep showing up for, I think, the same thing that I've been observing for 30 years. That people in general, including people in this philosophy, are still kind of hanging on to something that doesn't really work for them. And I'm not making anybody wrong about this because I've, I've come to the point that this idea of, of a little bit of, of dissatisfaction with our lives, a little bit of self-criticism, a little bit of, of thinking, eh, it's not quite working yet, there's still something to work out, is a part of the human condition. And our job isn't to get rid of that. We don't need to get rid of it. We simply need to manage it. I have not met many enlightened people. In fact, I think I've only met one. And that was about 10 years ago. I met a woman at the Eastern Conference in Atlanta. I don't even remember where she was from. I had the opportunity, we, we had, uh, during the, uh, the week of the event uh, in, in Atlanta, we, uh, we went, not off-site, but we went a distance away from where our regular meeting room was to this outside area to do something. I don't even remember what we were doing. But I had the opportunity of, of driving this woman over there uh, for this whatever we were doing. And she's probably the most enlightened person I'd ever met. She was, uh, she was African American. She was in her 90s. Her father had been a slave. She had embraced this teaching so completely that our short time together of driving out and driving back, everything she said was so 
exquisitely present in the moment with no judgment, with absolute clarity, that I figure if I ever am going to be enlightened, I'm going to be like her. And she was in her 90s. I got a ways. Everybody else, and this is no complaint or comment or judgment of any of you, everyone else I've ever met seems to still have this little thing going on where it's just easy to go back into a story or to find a fault or to judge something. Don't even know you're doing it. It's amazing how often I catch people saying, you know, that's really hard. And I, you know, my line back to them is, well, if you want it to be hard, it could be hard. And they look at me and go, oh. You know, but then I look at my life. I make things hard all the time. <laughs> you know, so I, I'm in no position to judge anybody. Uh, I'm on this path of managing that thing inside of me that isn't quite completely gone. I remember uh, years ago I had this wonderful epiphany about my inner critic. And I went, I've handled my inner critic. I, that thing's dead and gone. And then, it does, it, you know, every so often Barbara will say, you are so self-critical. And I'm going, no, I'm not a handle guy. <laughs> We're all doing it, you know? We're all in the game of being in this uh, three-dimensional dualistic world, yet remembering all the time that there's something else going on. There's something greater going on. We talk about this thing of oneness. I believe in the idea of oneness, but the, the idea of oneness has to work within the world of multiplicity, which is where we are. We all have bodies. We all are thinking different thoughts. We all have different perspectives. We all have different perceptions of life. That's what makes life interesting. If we were all the same, that wouldn't work. We had it on my president's teleconference call this week. I had uh, the chair, a member of, of our diversity commission within our organization, Centers for Spiritual Living. And it was wonderful. We had the conversation about how oneness is not sameness. There are different things. The, the, the fact that we're different enriches our lives, yet we're uncomfortable with it. When people think differently than, or look differently than us. We feel uncomfortable with that. We're more comfortable if everybody's the same. You know what? If everybody was the same, life would be so freaking boring. And we, and we wouldn't have the fullness and richness we have because we are diverse, because we are different. And we are different on so many levels, it's not even worth looking at. We're all different. Yet we find this thing of commonality when we come into this room. We're all on the path of wanting to know how to live a better life. How to feel full and rich with our lives. How not to fall into traps that we so often have fallen into in our lives of something less than that. So I'm thinking about what I want to say about this today. We come together to find tools. I do anyway. I come to find tools that I can use to make my life work better. And I was kind of just meandering through the, 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 uh, some, some of Holmes' quotes that I particularly like. And I have hundreds of them. And I found one that really spoke to this. It's a little long, but I think it's worth it. And I want to share it with you. I shall keep the promise that I have made to myself. I shall never again tell myself that I am poor, sick, weak, or unhappy. I shall not lie to myself anymore, but shall daily speak the truth of my inner soul, telling it that it is wonderful and marvelous, that it is one with great, the great cause of all life, truth, power, and action. I shall whisper these things into my soul until it breaks forth into songs of joy with the realization of its limitless possibilities. I said, that's the one. That's what I want to share. So leave that up for a while, okay, Pat? That's what I want to share. I want to share the idea that we can use as a tool the idea of promise. That we can promise ourselves something. And a promise isn't just a casual thing. A promise is quite a powerful tool. Sometimes we use it. Sometimes we don't. Some of us are afraid of the word promise because it's going to get us into something we're going to end up not wanting. But truly, the idea of promise is a very powerful spiritual tool. I align it with the idea of an agreement. But there's some interesting things about the idea of promise that Holmes speaks to in this that I, I want to, to point attention to. So uh, let's read it together. Can we do that? So I came out of all of us, not just me. I shall keep the promise that I have made to myself. I shall never again tell myself that I am poor, sick, weak, nor unhappy. I shall not lie to myself anymore, but shall daily speak the truth to my inner soul, 
telling it that it is wonderful and marvelous, that it is one with the great cause of all life, truth, power, and action. I shall whisper these things into my soul until it breaks forth into songs of joy with the realization of its limitless possibilities. So in your program today, you'll find that there's a little slip of paper. Little, just a little slip that's buried somewhere in the midst of it. And all it says is, I, prom I promise myself. And then it's got two lines, just a starting point. I'm not actually going to ask you to write on it today. If you want to write on it, that's fine. What I want you to do is take it with you today, after we have this conversation, and think about what you can promise yourself. But there's elements of this that we really need to talk about. So I want to talk about what a promise is and what will make it work for you, what will make it effective. So to do that, I have six items or six uh, elements that I want to share with you. The first one is that promises are agreements, and agreements are sacred trusts. When we, when we say to ourselves or to someone else, I promise to do this. It's not a casual thing. It's not a, just a, uh, you know, it doesn't mean you're going to try. It doesn't mean that you want to. It doesn't mean that maybe this is what could happen. It means you're promising. It's a sacred trust. Now, that sounds like a burden, but actually that's what empowers it. Because if you were casual, if you were thinking that this is just something that might or might not happen, then the chances of it happening fall to almost zero. Whereas if you actually say that you're going to do it, if you make that commitment to yourself, then it could happen. It really could. And, and the, the chances of that are much, much higher. The second element I wanted to suggest is our ability to keep promises is equal to our sense of being trustworthy. Not everybody sees themselves as trustworthy. Now, is there anybody here that, that never told a lie? That's correct. <laughs> and the person that we lie to is ourselves. Yes, we've, known, we've been known to lie to other people, but the, people, the person that we lie to the most is ourselves. Because we, we tell ourselves that somehow we're not good enough, or that we're not uh, clear enough, or we're not something enough to do what needs to be done. We're the one that keeps getting in our way, and we do that by lying to ourselves. Because that's not true. We can do anything we set our minds to, as Holmes said there, the limitless possibilities are ours. The only, the only limit is when we place a limitation upon ourselves. We do it all, all the time. It's our, it's our out. It's our way to let ourselves off the hook. But we're not on a hook. We're creative spiritual beings that can really do something extraordinary if we take ourselves serious. It, eh, serious, that's such a funny word. If we know who we are, that's a better way to say it. When we know who we are, we know we can accomplish anything. So the idea that we're not trustworthy because we've lied to ourselves many, many times just defeats the purpose. So begin by knowing that you are trustworthy, that you can trust yourself with a promise, that it doesn't have, you don't have to fail just because you failed before. Besides, the thing you think was a failure was an opportunity to, to get a handle on who you are, and that's all it ever was. So our third element that I wanted to bring to you is that all our promises are made with ourselves. I learned this one from Will Rockingbear. He told a great story once. He was traveling uh, through South and Central America. He was a showman. And one of his hosts offered him the company of a, of a beautiful young lady. And he said, no, thank you. And the man said, well, why not? And he said, well, uh, I'm in a monogamous relationship. I'm married. And he said, well, your wife doesn't have to know. He said, oh, but I will know. Ah, oh, I will know. Therefore, that would make me a liar. So when you make a promise, it sounds like you're making it to someone else. But the only one you're really promising to is yourself. That's where the work is. So whenever you say, I promise you, what you're saying is, I promise myself that I will do this. There's no way that you can promise them and not promise yourself that the work is at the point of view, that they are witness to your promise. They may even expect benefit from your promise. But the one that you're promising is yourself. And you can keep a promise to yourself. 
because you are a spiritual being that can do anything, that has limitless possibilities. Therefore, you can keep a promise to yourself. So we let go of the idea of ever not being trustworthy. We are worthy of trust. We can trust ourselves if we do this in a way that has meaning and, and in strong intention with it. On the fourth one of these, we learn keeping promises not to do something is harder than keeping promises to. I remember I talked about making it harder. This is my observation, and it, there's a purpose behind it. You see, in, in Holmes's promise to himself, the first thing he promised was not to do certain things, remember? He promised, he promised never again to tell himself he was poor, sick, weak, or unhappy. He promised uh, not to lie to himself anymore. Okay, well those, are, those are, are moving away from certain conditions. The problem with moving away from something, with trying not to do something, and Rocky Bear had a lovely example of this, is like tying a rope to a tree and pulling on that rope as hard as you can, screaming at the tree to let go. <laughs> it doesn't work, it doesn't work. That what we must do is we must, we must focus upon what we want instead of what we don't want. Because we all know what's not working. And we talk about how we want to get rid of what's not working. But what we have to do, if you want to do that, that's fine. But what you have to do is you have to replace it with something that is working. So the essence of what, of what you want to do is promise yourself that something wonderful is being created in your life. That you are creating something wonderful, something meaningful, something powerful in your life by your actions. I think, well, the thing that inspired this talk was a conversation uh, with a young man who's uh, working on the issue of smoking cigarettes, of tobacco and nicotine addiction. It is, it's an addiction. You can't promise yourself not to smoke. That's a lost cause. Because we, the things that we do that, that, are, that are not in our best interest, we mostly do unconsciously. We just do it. And then we find ourselves in the middle of it. I mean, they'll talk about that in AA all day, about how I was sober for six months and all of a sudden I found a drink in my hand. Because the accepting of that drink, pouring of that drink, whatever it was, was done unconsciously out of an old habit. So you don't want to try to not do an old habit. What you want to try to do is something new, something better, something powerful, something meaningful. That's where you want to put your attention. It's fine to say what you're not going to do. It's really good to do that. And they call that in, spirit, in doing spiritual mind treatments, the denial step. We don't really teach the denial step here because we don't want to put attention on it. We just want to turn away from it and focus on what we do want. But if you need to say it, absolutely. If you want to claim that I won't do that anymore, that's great. If you want to promise yourself you're not going to do anything, that's great. But what you must do is, is bring to yourself something that you are going to do in place of it. You must fill that void. The void won't, won't, won't exist very long. So you must fill it with something. What is it you want to do? Number five. Broken promises often occur at an unconscious state. I kind of already talked about that. Uh, I've, my, my, my first spiritual teacher used the example. He said, if you, if you put a coffee mug in your hand and you kept it there long enough, eventually you'd forget there was a coffee mug there. You will do the same with habits. You will do them and not know that you're doing them, not think about them. They're just there. Suddenly that drink or that cigarette or that action or that, that compulsion is back. Didn't even notice where it came from, but it's always been there. And the final one that's on the list here is reminding ourselves of our promise every day helps us keep our promise. That's why you've got a little slip of paper. That's why it will serve you if you write the thing that you promised to yourself down in writing and then post it somewhere where you will see it every day until it becomes an innate part of who you are. It doesn't really take that long, but it takes a while. And if you think you're going to read it once and put it away and remember it, you're not. So write something down on the paper. There's an interesting thing about writing is we are creative beings and the first thing we do to create is often to create words that symbolize the thing that we, the condition we want. The words are a creation. So create the words and then create the condition by repeating the words again and again and again until they become an innate part of you. That's what I offer you today. The idea of promise. You can promise yourself something, and in so doing, create something wonderful in your life. But you have to do it consciously. You have to do it willingly. You have to do it with an open heart, 
ready for it to bring whatever it needs to bring into your life. So, is there anyone here? <laughs> it's a tricky thing. Is there anyone here that thinks they cannot come up with a promise for themselves? That was the correct answer. You can. <laughs> so, whatever that is, if you know what it is already, if I started this talk, you would, I know what it is. Great. If you're sitting there going, I'm not sure at all what it is, it doesn't matter, it's in you. And if you call it forth, it will, it will be there. And you will put something either on that little slip of paper or on another piece of paper. I don't care what, what you do or how you do it. I just want you to do it. So what I want to do right now is ask you to close your eyes for a moment. We're going to do a blessing. We're going to do a blessing on this idea of a promise. Whatever it is that you are called to promise yourself, I want you to know that this comes out of, of a high sense of consciousness a high awareness of who you are on your spiritual path. And if you're thinking you don't know who you are on your spiritual path, I want you to know you do. And that as you pick those words to promise yourself, that those words that symbolize a change in condition, a change in circumstance, a change in action, that this is a sacred covenant that you're creating with yourself. It's one you can keep. It's one that if you falter, you can pick it back up and do it again. It's one that is not here to hurt you or limit you, only to advance you on your spiritual awakening. I want you to know that whatever you can write down as a promise to yourself can change your life forever. It doesn't mean that you're not going to have challenges. It doesn't mean that you're not going to question. It doesn't mean that everything is always going to be sweetness and light from, from now on in your life. What it means is that you're willing to take a deeper look and a higher step along this path. And that something wonderful can occur through this journey of a promise. And I know that within you, you have the full capability of doing this, as do I of using this tool to make a better world out of your better life. Whatever it takes, you have it within you to do. And I bless that place in you. I bless that journey. I bless that step. This is the work. And we let it happen. Whole and complete right now. And so it is. You good with this? Yeah. Good. Thank you. Thank you for your lovely attention. I love you so much. Yeah.